Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I trust and hope that you are all well. Before I get started, I would like to make a quick announcement and I'm sorry if it's going to be a rant. Not too long ago, I made a community post wishing the LGBTQIA community a very happy Pride Month. This channel accepts everyone for who they are, no matter your skin color, your sexual orientation, or anything else. This channel is a sleep therapy channel. To come onto the channel and comment disgusting, disgusting comments comments and death threats is not accepted. A lot of you did not see the comment that someone left. Thank you, God. I was able to catch it in time and I got rid of that comment. I cannot state enough. This channel is for healing. It is for entertainment and it's also for relaxation. It makes no sense to me why people <laughs> want to get on someone's channel and just make a fool of themselves by exposing the true ugliness that's inside their heart. So with that being said, for those that are out there that have an issue with me bringing to light and wishing a happy Pride Month to somebody, you can keep those comments to yourself or you can unsubscribe and go somewhere else. I really don't have an issue with that. The audience that is here supports this channel. People subscribe to this channel because they like the stories that are being told and this is not a channel for hate. Now, I want to address one more thing and then we'll go ahead and get into today's stories. There was another comment left stating that I am milking my audience for membership money and Patreon money because I claim that cussing and certain words can't be said on YouTube. That, in fact, is a lie. I would never, ever, ever trick anyone into giving me money whatsoever. I am strictly following YouTube's guidelines. And if anyone doesn't believe me, you can look at the guidelines yourself as to what content creators on YouTube can and cannot say here on YouTube. And if we are to say them, our channel can get a strike, the video can be removed, or the channel itself can be completely deleted. And I don't know about all of you, but I really, really, really want to keep back to ashes. I enjoy reading to you all and helping you obtain your dose of vocal melatonin. So if anyone thinks that I am bamboozling people out of money, well, you're mistaken and you too can unsubscribe and go elsewhere. Now, some of you might come across channels that use language that we're not supposed to use. That is on that content creator and they are taking a risk of getting their channel shut down. But me, that's not happening here. This channel, as I will state once again, is for positivity. It is a sleep therapy channel and I enjoy sitting here narrating and I also like to be very transparent with my audience. And last but not least, I must inform you, YouTube is pushing for watch time upon us creators. So if you would take the time and watch the video all the way through, it would be much appreciated as it does help the algorithm and lets YouTube know that you do enjoy listening to this channel. You can either listen to it all the way through or just let the video play as that tells YouTube that this channel is worth listening to. Like I always say down in the description box below, if you'd like to become a member of Back to Ashes, or if you would like to become a member of the Patreon, and if you like what you're hearing and would like to buy me a coffee, as it would be much appreciated, all that can be found in the description box below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and enjoy this dose of vocal melatonin entitled Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 4. Right after this introduction, there will be an ad. I'll read the first case, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. An unidentified woman was found burned in a parking place near the Black Forest in Tochnau, Germany. Who was she? This is one of the cases featured in the Identify Me campaign in Interpol. The day was Thursday, the 24th of July, 1997, at the height of the summer in Germany, when near the aforementioned parking place burnt and severed remains of a young woman was discovered partially buried in a hole. Near the site, a shovel was discovered, which was possibly used to bury her. According to the investigators, she was buried there for many days, 
possibly up to two weeks. Because she was skeletonized, the investigators couldn't create a facial reconstruction and depend on her clothing in order to uncover her identity. The woman is described as follows. She was around 20 years old at the time and was 1.64 meters tall. It's also speculated that she had brown long hair and was thin. Her clothing, a dark blue skirt with flowers of the brand Devile, a blue belt with a gold buckle, a white woolen shirt of the brand Trend, white sandals also with gold buckles, a bright bra, Along with the shovel, a handbag of the brand Delani was found in the outside area of the motel Prager Baden. The questions that the investigators need to answer are, does anybody know this lady? Does anyone know a lady that fits the above description and is since July of 1997 never seen again? Can anyone give any tips about the handbag that was found? Who is the Gloucester County Jane Doe and who strangled her? On the 4th of February 1990, a body was discovered in Deptford Township. It was found in what was then a wooded area between the Pathmark Supermarket, now the Edge Fitness Club's gym, and the club at Locust Grove Housing Department on Clements Bridge Road in Deptford Township, New Jersey. Apparently, the location was littered with car parts. Her remains were skeletal and incomplete. According to Namus, she was missing one or more limbs and one or more hands. There were sweatpants tied around her neck, and her cause of death is believed to be ligature strangulation. She is believed to have been between 16 to 20 years old and to have been dead for one to two years before her discovery, placing her time of death around 1988 to 1989. It was determined that she was between 5'5 five five and 5'8 five and 120 to 145 pounds. She was white with medium to dark brown hair, misaligned teeth, several of which have silver fillings, a crooked philtrum, the group between the base of the nose and the upper lip, and a nasal septum deviation to the right. According to a newspaper from the time, she also had an overbite. Several pieces of jewelry were found with the body, and multiple items of clothing were found inside the sweatpants around her neck. The jewelry includes a 14-karat gold horseshoe earring with a spiral pattern, a yellow gold ball earring, and a 16-inch faux pearl bead necklace. The clothing inside the medium-sized Toltex branded sweatpants were a pair of nylon pantyhose, a mid-length sock, and a knee-length nylon stocking. No fingerprints were found. However, DNA, dental charts, and dental x-rays are available according to the New Jersey State Police. The full DNA profile was uploaded to the Federal Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, in 2008. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out to investigators in 2020, asking if they could renew the case, and investigators are also working with the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification in an effort to use genealogy to identify the victim. The current theory from law enforcement is that she was a runaway from a different area, as she would have been identified by now if she was from the area. The fact she was found in an area near the New Jersey Turnpike and Route 55 seems to support this theory. According to Unidentified Awareness, 10 women have been ruled out as possible matches. They don't list them on the site. However, I was only able to find four. Carol Dawn disappeared from West Palm Beach, Florida in 1980. Tracy Crow 
disappeared from Millersburg, Pennsylvania on August 5, 1989. Alicia Markovich disappeared from Blairsville, Pennsylvania on April 26, 1987. Tiffany Sessions disappeared from Gainesville, Florida on February 9, 1989. She has remained unidentified for 33 years. With genealogy underway, I have hope that she will be identified in the coming years. Hopefully, we have a breakthrough soon. If you have any information regarding the case, please contact the Deppert Township Police Department. Phone number 856-686-2227 and the Gloucester County Prosecutor's Office. Phone number 856 856- 384-5680 or email at mcu at co.glaucaster.nj.us Who Killed Domenico LaRusso? 31-year-old Domenico LaRusso was en route back to his home along with his fiance on their bikes after a night out with friends. They were riding along the Isar Lake in Munich when an unidentified man walking in the opposite direction spit at his fiance seemingly without any reason. Domenico went then to confront the man while his fiance stayed 50 meters behind. Due to the time being 2200, she could not see clearly, but she heard a commotion between the two men and subsequently Domenico screaming. He had been stabbed many times and the fatal one went straight into his heart. On the 28th of May, a banner was posted at the site of the murder in hopes of getting some new leads. The man is described as follows. 1.80 meters tall. At the day of the crime, he either wore a large jacket or a coat, and he had a shoulder bag. A re-exam of the case in 2022 found the police investigating 7,500 people whose cell phones pinged a cell phone tower in the bridge near the scene, but they bared no fruit. Apart from that, Saliva samples were taken from 5,800 individuals, but were also not helpful. The police also followed up on 400 reports of people spitting, and it is said that the investigations will continue. Domenico and his fiance were only engaged for a week, and the next day had planned to make a trip to their hometown to announce the wedding day to his parents. This investigation is still ongoing. After working a late-night shift at Taco Bell, 21-year-old Katara Johnson would be found shot to death inside of her mobile home the following day. Who killed Katara and why? Introduction Katara Boise Johnson was born to parents Herbert Robinson and Linda Johnson on February 19, 1983, in Georgetown, Texas. With four additional siblings, Katara would eventually relocate to Taylor, Texas, where she would continue to grow and thrive into adulthood. Known as Tara by family and friends, Katara was described as outgoing, smart, popular, hardworking, reliable, and extremely independent. Early on, she acquired a deep love of sports, basketball in particular, and was a devoted member of her local church. Katara's straight A's at Taylor High School and her athletic ability on the court eventually led her to receive a full college scholarship to Central Christian College in McPherson, Kansas. Despite turning down the scholarship in order to remain close to home, Katara worked diligently as an assistant manager at her local Taco Bell. Timeline On August 25, 2004, Katara worked and completed a closing shift at Taco Bell, located at 2009 North Main, St. Taylor, Texas, 76574. 
After her shift ended, she drove to her mobile home off of North Dolan Street, where she lived alone. Note, the distance from the Taco Bell to Katara's mobile home is less than a five-minute drive. The following day, after not hearing from Katara for several hours, Katara's grandmother and six-year-old nephew decided to stop by her home, only to discover a gruesome scene. Katara would be found lying deceased in her hallway from an apparent gunshot wound. Investigation During the earlier hours of the investigation, neighbors confirmed seeing Katara arrive home, but would also notice her red Mitsubishi Lancer gone mere hours later, eventually to be found at the Thorndale Community Pool, about a 13-mile distance away from Taylor and into the neighboring county. In regards to the crime scene, Katara's family reported that there was no blood inside of the residence and no obvious signs of a violent struggle. Investigators later discovered that the back door to the trailer was unlocked and slightly open. Conclusion Katara was 21 years old at the time of her death and she would be 40 today if her life wasn't abruptly and unfairly taken from her. Despite the setbacks, the frustration, and the lack of answers, Katara's family hasn't given up their fight to one day bring Katara's killer, or killers, to justice. They do everything they can to make sure Katara isn't just another unsolved case or a forgotten victim in the system. Katara was a very beautiful person. She loved everybody, and everybody loved her. My mother is on one side of her. I'm on the other side of her. She's right in the middle. If there had been some kind of noise, we would have heard. She was special, and she's going to be missed. Rodney Johnson, Katara's uncle, told KVUE News. In August of 2019... The cold case unit at the Williamson County Sheriff's Office began assisting Taylor police with Katara's investigation, testing apparent DNA samples on some items according to Taylor Police Chief Henry Fluck. The results of that testing is unknown, and as of today, this case has no promising leads and remains unsolved. If you have any information in regards to Katara's case or would like to submit a tip, please contact any of the following. Taylor Police Sergeant Sam Breister, 512-352-5551. Williamson County Crime Stoppers, 800-253-7687. Texas Rangers, 800-346-3243. Nine years ago, multiple emergency calls were being attempted from two missing women's phones within a Panamanian jungle. What happened to Chris Kramers and Lisa Ann Froon? A refreshed take on the case. As of April 1st, 2023, it has been nearly a decade since the last sighting of Chris Kramers, 21, and Lisa Ann Froon, 22. The two young women were friends who worked at the same cafe together in Amherst Fort, Netherlands. They planned a six-week-long vacation from the Netherlands to Panama, hoping to improve their Spanish and offer volunteer help for the locals in addition to sightseeing. After deciding to go for a hike one afternoon, Chris and Lisa Ann disappeared, having their belongings and select body parts turn up ten weeks later. It has now been nine years since these women disappeared, and time only seems to bring more questions than answers. Nearly a decade of speculation, odd circumstances, and rumors have all left many people who are invested in this case divided on the outcome. Chris and Lisa Ann had already been elsewhere in Panama for a couple of weeks when they arrived in Boquette. Boquette is a small town situated in western Panama, surrounded by dense jungles, mountains, and river valleys. 
The culture in Bacat is lively with frequent musical performances and a weekly art market. With a population of approximately 20,000 people, about one-fifth being expats, mostly from North America. The town radiates a close-knit small-town feel. Once in Boquette, Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon arrived at a school where they made plans to volunteer, but were turned away upon arrival and were told to return the next week. This change of plans freed their schedules, so new activities were planned, one of them being hiking the El Peñanista Trail on April 1st. Though multiple locals say they witnessed the women leaving for their hike sometime after 1 p.m., the timestamps on Lisa Ann's camera placed the two at the trailhead at an estimated 11.08 a.m. Because Lisa Ann had never traveled further than Germany, documenting a trip this far on her new Canon PowerShot camera was important to her. She took many great photos highlighting their trip, the ones at the start of the specific hike being those of the path and of her and Chris. There are a handful of images that document the women's trek up to the Mirador and the Outlook. Regardless of the time they had left, it took them just under two hours to reach the Mirador, where they stayed for at least 15 minutes, tracking celebratory pictures. El Pianista is a narrow hiking trail that winds through the rolling hills and dense jungles of Panama, located four kilometers north of Boquette. With an elevation of more than 600 meters, El Pianista is located within a cloud forest. Much of the path takes place inside a cloud should it be rainy or humid enough. If you stay on the path, it is carved out and should be fairly straightforward. Vegetation thrives in damp, humid, rainforest environments like this. So plants beyond the path regularly become too thick to traverse without the aid of a machete. Once reaching the Mirador, if you are lucky enough to be out of the clouds as Chris and Lisa Ann were, you are welcome with a breathtaking view of the surrounding area. On a sunny day, visibility will be far enough for you to view both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans from the Mirador. When it was time to leave, instead of taking the south path that would lead them back to Boquette, Chris and Lisa Ann ended up taking the north one off the Mirador. These two paths are apparently distinguishable, the Boquette side of the mountain having a view of nearby town, Alto Boquette, while the other is purely vegetation. This means it's unlikely that Chris and Lisa Ann accidentally took the wrong path. They were also given the advice that they needed to turn around on El Pianista after reaching the Mirador, so it is unlikely they were attempting to loop around by following the trail further. The North Path is one that is used almost exclusively by locals and is much more difficult to navigate without preparation and a guide. A handful of photos of their time on the North Path were taken, including photo 508, which shows Chris standing on a rock while crossing a stream, turning to face slightly towards the camera, as if Lisa Ann called her name. This is the last photo from Lisa Ann's camera that day, taken at 1.54 p.m. After this point, the timeline becomes even less clear and more things are subject to speculation. Between 1.54 p.m. and 4.39 p.m., something happened that caused the women to place an emergency call. The call was made from Chris's iPhone 4 and the caller dialed 112 the emergency services number in the European Union. Another one was placed shortly after from Lisa Ann's Samsung Galaxy at 4.51 p.m., also dialing 112. These calls failed to connect. When Chris and Lisa Ann felt to show up for an appointment, they arranged with a local guide on the morning of April 2nd. He would alert their host family and authorities of their disappearance. Their families were called at around 6 p.m. and informed that the pair had not returned to their host family since the day before. 
Hans Kremers, Chris's father, recalls how he tried to get in contact with Chris on the second. He sent a message asking how she was and asking for a message in return, but would never receive a response. Meanwhile, more emergency calls were being attempted from Chris and Lisa Ann's phones, starting at about 7 a.m. 112 was continuously called until 10.52 a.m. when 911, the Panamanian Emergency Services number, is finally dialed. No meaningful connection was ever made from either of their phones, though there was a brief moment where Lisa Ann's phone connected on the second. The connection was so weak and brief that the women were probably unaware the call received a signal. On April 3rd, Cineproc search team started searching the jungle surrounding El Pinista. Families of Chris and Lisa Ann arrived in Boquette on April 6th. Chris and Lisa Ann's phones were being used throughout the week following their disappearance, but none of this would be known to investigators at that time. At first, attempts to reach emergency services were made, but later it turned into checking the signal in time, with multiple attempts made each day. A unique event on April 3rd indicates that on Chris's phone, the contact of their host mother, Miriam, was searched for on WhatsApp before the phone was powered off. Lisa Ann's Samsung Galaxy died at 5 a.m. on April 4th, but activity on Chris's phone continued. The last time the pen was entered on Chris's phone was April 5th, but periodic service and time checks were done on the phone until April 11th, when the iPhone 4 was powered off for the final time. Searches continued, and a month later, the parents of Chris and Lisa Ann raised the reward money to 30,000 US dollars. No trace of the woman was found, and the investigation began to fizzle out until 10 weeks later on June the 11th. The backpack that Lisa Ann and Chris had been wearing was found. A woman from Alto Romero, a small community north of Boquette, went to the nearby Calibra River to bathe and found the bag on the shore of the river. The bag was in fair condition, though still showed signs of wear and tear. Within this bag, the pair's bras, phones, sunglasses, and other personal items were found. This was when we would finally learn about the phone records and the attempts to call for help. Lisa Ann's Canon power shot was also found. It appears there was one photo taken after photo 508. Photo 509. This photo was mysteriously deleted either intentionally by connecting the memory card to a computer or by a malfunctioning of the camera, probably when it failed to take a video. Photo 509 becomes the missing link between Chris and Lisa Ann's hike and the events that were to follow. Lisa Ann's camera was examined and it was discovered that on April 8th, a week after their hike on El Panista, 100 photos were taken somewhere in a Panamanian jungle between the hours of about 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. They all show dense foliage illuminated by the flash of the camera. It appears to be raining. Some photos show debris like red plastic grocery bags attached to branches or shredded parts of their map resting on large rocks. One photo shows the back of Chris's head. These photos are taken mostly by a stationary photographer, pivoting as if to take photos of their surroundings. The discovery of the backpack led to more searches along the Calibra River, which resulted in the discovery of Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon's remains. Only small parts of their bodies were ever located. Two bones belonging to Chris were the only ones ever found, her pelvis and a rib. Her pelvis was broken, almost in half, and her bones contained high levels of phosphorus, which does not present in the soil surrounding the riverbed. A shattered foot still tied securely in its boot, a tibia, a femur, and 28 more bone fragments belonging to Lisa Ann were found as well. 
The remains of her leg showed Lisa Ann suffering from periostitis, a condition caused by the swelling of the connective tissue surrounding the bone, caused by overexertion. From this, it can be determined that she was walking for long periods of time and distance before she passed away. Her remains appeared to be in a fresher state of decomposition than Chris's. Lisa Ann's bones did not appear to have the same high levels of phosphorus. Despite being found in the river, there were no signs of wear and tear on the bones, man-made or natural, suggesting they hadn't been in the area for very long. Chris's jean shorts were also found along the river. Contrary to what many sources have reported, Chris's shorts were not found neatly folded on a rock by the river. Photos recently were leaked that show Chris's shorts were found caught on a tree branch, partially submerged in the Calibra River. Panama officials closed the case of Chris Krimmers and Lisa Ann Froon in March of 2015 declaring the two dead of a hiking accident. Chris and Lisa Ann's remains were returned to their families and buried in Roosthoff Cemetery in Lewiston, Netherlands. A memorial was erected at the Mirador in memory of Chris and Lisa Ann. While there is plenty to debate surrounding the outcome of the women, the families of Chris and Lisa Ann have made peace with the assumption their loved ones were lost in the jungle and passed away due to a hiking accident. So, what happened? While Chris and Lisa Ann were warned to turn back at the Mirador or bring a guide, it was a beautiful sunny day and the women had made it to their destination quite quickly on their own. El Pianista is already an out and back trail. What if they decided to go a little further out? They still had ample sunlight and El Pianista was easy enough to navigate that maybe the rest of the path was too in their minds. They were likely experiencing hikers high if this was the case. While most of the forest alongside the path of El Pianista is too dense to navigate Sands Machete, continuing on the north path that Chris and Lisa Ann started down, eventually transitions between jungle and open, hilly fields, making it easy to lose the path if you don't know your way. By the time they realized they had gone too far, they could have already been kilometers off their original course. Following flowing water to civilization is a well-known survival rule, even to someone with limited wilderness experience. If they had gotten lost off the trail, it is possible Lisa Ann or Chris knew this rule and decided to follow the first stream they came across, possibly the Calibra or one of its tributaries, to find their way back to Boquette. The only problem with this plan would be that the Calibra flows north, away from Boquette. The women would likely be unaware of the river's direction of flow and incorrectly assume by following it, Boquette would be right around the corner. The SIM pen on Chris's iPhone was never entered after April 5th, and Lisa Ann's remains appeared fresher than those of Chris. Could this mean Chris passed away first, causing Lisa Ann to attempt one last desperate hike to safety? The periostitis in Lisa Ann's leg may suggest this. Cineproc search terms started their night searches on April 7th. Were the nighttime photos taken during the early morning of April 8th an attempt to signal a rescue? Maybe being too weak to call out, they used the flash of Lisa Ann's camera to attempt to signal search teams. Unfortunately, the foliage is too thick for that small of a flash to pass through. The night photos could have otherwise been a marker for Chris's body had Lisa Ann planned her last desperate hike to safety. She could have eventually wanted to return to lay her friend to rest. Why were Chris and Lisa Ann's garments found, but their bodies were not? Does this indicate a third party removing them? Did Chris and Lisa Ann remove the garments themselves? Wearing a bra for an extended period of time is typically slightly uncomfortable at the very least. The elastic and underwire of certain bras can constrict and dig into your skin. Additionally, a few hours in the Panamanium sun 
will almost inevitably have you sweating through your clothes if you're not used to it. Assuming the absence of foul play, did Chris also take her shorts off because of discomfort? Or could an alternative use for them have been a makeshift pillow while camped out at the night photo location? The inconsistencies between witness statements, connections between locals, and the group of people that continuously show up in the case, a handful of whom are now dead themselves, may raise suspicion to some. To others, a town of 20,000 people means you have a limited number of individuals your age to hang out with, forcing the formation of tight-knit friend groups. Due to all the inconsistencies in the case and so little evidence of the women being found has left us asking the question of was it a morbid murder cover-up by a third party, or simply a close-knit, small town discombobulated from the tragic disappearance of two bright young women. As more fine-tuned details leak about this case, such as an attempt to reach Miriam or the state of Chris's shorts, the lost theory starts to overtake the foul play one. How did Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon spend the last days of their lives? What is the most plausible explanation for the night photos? What evidence keeps you from making a conclusive decision on this case? Pinellas County Jane Doe identified as missing Arizona mother. When two children in Florida called the cops on Halloween of 1969 about a suspicious black trunk they'd seen unknown men disposing of in an empty lot, the St. Petersburg police had no idea they were about to encounter one of the most difficult cold cases of their careers. Upon opening the trunk, the police discovered a recently deceased woman's remains covered in plastic and masking tape. A towel was wrapped around her head, covered in blood. She appeared to be dressed for bed, wearing a green nightgown and hair curlers pinned into place. Medical examiners determined that the woman was likely in her mid-twenties to mid-thirties and likely died as a result of strangulation with a bolo tie in addition to blunt force trauma to her skull. Jane Doe was likely intoxicated at the time of her death and showed no defensive wounds, leading investigators to suspect that her killer was someone known to her. Upon releasing her description to the press, the St. Petersburg Police Department received hundreds of leads and tips from those who thought they may have known her. The trunk she was found in was delivered to the FBI, though law enforcement declined to release the results of their forensic testing. None of these leads panned out, and eventually, investigators released a sketch of the woman and her dental records describing her unique upper partial denture plate. Despite many leads, the case went cold, and without knowing who Jane Doe was, they had no way to find her killer. With the advent of DNA nearly 30 years later, a DNA profile for her was loaded into CODIS, the national DNA database for the United States, with no matches from her relatives. Finally, in 2022, seeing the success of other jurisdictions with genetic genealogy, Law enforcement decided that Jane Doe would be a good candidate for the testing. Much to their delight, genetic genealogy helped pinpoint a likely identification for the unknown woman found in Florida, Sylvia June Atherton, a 41-year-old mother of five from Tucson, Arizona, who disappeared with her young daughters in 1969 after leaving with her husband. A surviving daughter of hers, Sillen, noted that the last time she saw her mother was when her mother and stepfather dropped her off at her biological father's home in Chicago. Her husband, who died in 1999, never reported Sylvia missing, and it is currently unknown what has happened to her daughters. A quick update to this story. 
Her other missing children were 20-year-old Donna Lindhurst and her sister, 5-year-old Kimberly Ann Brown. In July 1975, a young woman disappeared from her apartment complex without a trace. Ten years later, a nearby electrician would commit two shocking child murders in South Carolina. Was Denise Newsom Porch the victim of a suspected serial killer? Background Denise Porch and her husband of one year, Rodney, lived in Charlotte, North Carolina having recently moved there from the nearby town of Denton. The 21-year-old was the apartment manager for Yorktown Apartments off Tybola Road, where she and her husband also resided. Theirs was regarded as a loving marriage between two childhood sweethearts. At the time of her disappearance, she and her husband were eagerly awaiting an upcoming concert for the soft rock group Sills and Croft. Disappearance On July 31st, 1975, Rodney returned home from work at 8 p.m. He found a note from Denise taped to the front door, which said she had slipped out to show apartments to a prospective renter and expected to arrive back before 3 p.m. There were a number of red flags. The television had been left on, and her Chevy Camaro was still in the driveway. She hadn't taken her pocketbook with her. Neighbors had reported seeing Denise talking to a man outside that afternoon, but none of this eyewitness information ever led to any leads. Denise was declared legally dead in 1982. Larry Jean Bell At the time of her disappearance, an unassuming electrician named Larry Jean Bell lived about 300 yards away from Yorktown Apartments. Bell, originally from Alabama, had spent his adult years shuffling back and forth between Charlotte and Columbia, South Carolina areas, holding a series of unremarkable jobs. Eventually settling in Lexington County, South Carolina, the seemingly normal former Marine would go on to commit two shocking murders. Sherry Faye Smith, 17, was abducted outside her home on May 31, 1985. After a series of mocking phone calls to her family, Bell had forced Sherry to write a last will and testament to her parents before ultimately killing her. Only two weeks later, Deborah May Helmick, nine years old, had been found murdered following a continued dialogue between Bell and the Smith family. It is widely believed that Sherry Smith's older sister, Dawn, was the initial object of his infatuation, and Deborah's murder was nothing more than boiled over frustration taken out on yet another young blonde. Advancements in handwriting forensics ultimately led to Bell's capture. Following a trial largely characterized by his numerous unhinged outbursts, Bell was eventually sentenced to death. He died via electric chair on October 4, 1996. Bell's possible involvement in Denise's disappearance. Aside from the fact that he was living nearby at the time of her disappearance, authorities have other reasons, albeit coincidental, to believe he could have been involved. For one, Denise was a young woman with blonde hair in her early 20s the same profile as another object of his murderous lust, Dawn Smith. It is known that Bell liked to target specific blondes, but would settle on killing another one if the opportunity arose. There are also shades of similar M.O.s involved in Sherry's capture and murder and Denise's disappearance. Sherry's kidnapping took place in broad daylight, right at the end of her own family's driveway. The unidentified suspect in Denise's disappearance met with her outside in the middle of the day, which would seem equally brazen given that she was well known in that area due to her status as apartment manager. 
without a body or a game-changing new lead. Solving this nearly 50-year-old mystery doesn't seem very possible, but the close proximity of an infamous predator to the scene of the disappearance, combined with the victim's profile, may provide us with some clues. What happened to six-year-old Hattie Jackson? Washington, D.C., July 21st, 1961. Hattie Yvonne Jackson was born on September 22nd, 1954. She lived in Washington, D.C. with her family, which included an older brother. There is little information available on Hattie's life and the case itself, probably due to the age of the case so I think it's important to shed some light upon it. On the afternoon of July 21st, 1961, Hattie, her older brother, and some friends went to go play at Rock Creek Park. The kids began to swim in a creek when a police officer stopped and asked them to get out because the water was polluted. Hattie and the other kids obeyed the officer, and after the officer walked away, a man who'd been sitting down, presumably on a bench, nearby came over to the kids. The man said he could take them to another spot about two miles away to swim where the water was cleaner. The kids declined this offer and continued playing where they were. According to the Charlie Project, then Hattie disappeared and no one noticed her leave. This seemed like a, the kids turned around and Hattie was gone, situation. But there were several witnesses, apparently hikers just passing by, who would later report seeing two young men helping Hattie into a dull gray-blue older model Chrysler or Plymouth with yellow license plates near Rock Creek Park. The driver of this car was described as the same man who offered to give Hattie and her friends a ride. This man was described as white, between 30 and 40 years of age, with brown hair brushed straight back and a deep tan. The man wore a white shirt, gray trousers, a black belt, and sunglasses. He was about 5'9 and had a muscular build. This person hasn't been identified to this day. Rock Creek Park and the surrounding area were thoroughly searched but no trace of Hattie was ever found. However, a Medium article presented an interesting theory on Hattie's case. In May of 1962, the body of a young girl was found in the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. This body was found inside a box that formerly contained milk. The estimated time of death was in March 1962, and the girl was between four and six years of age. Apparently, Hattie was the only missing girl who matched this description at the time. But there was a problem, which doesn't rule this theory out completely, is that Hattie would have been kept alive for several months before being found in a different state. At the time Hattie Jackson vanished, she was described as a African-American female, six years old, between three foot and three foot four inches tall and around 45 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Hattie was last seen wearing a long sleeved white blouse, brown and white checkered shorts, pink sandals and a blue hair ribbon. Hattie's case remains unsolved. Helena, the young librarian who was tortured, murdered, and thrown off the roof of a building. The case reopens, and so does the mystery on her murderer's identity. The librarian from Sentiment was 27 years old when she was tortured, murdered, and thrown off the roof of a building on Car Calviet de Estrella in Sabadell, Spain. It was never confirmed. There are many elements to suspect that the young woman was also S.A.D. Helena was found naked and dead in a courtyard of a building. 
She had been drugged before being thrown unconscious and naked from the roof. Her body had several cigarette butt burns. Days before she was murdered, Jubini had received two disturbing anonymous notes. The first next to a bottle of horchata, and the second next to an orange and peach juice, both of which contained sleeping pills. However, the notes to the second juice gave a clear clue of who it could be as it stated the following. Helena, we hope you take this with a good sense of humor. The third note will be the one in which we reveal our identity. You will probably laugh. We would love to meet you again in another trip. She had joined a hiking club. We will talk about it. Don't be bad and drink it. Next time, you will invite us. The second time, Jubini did try the juice, but soon she began to feel dizzy and she stopped drinking it. The next day, she went to the hospital to take some analysis which detected the sleeping pills inside the liquid she had drank. Some time passed without any new events, until the 30th of November of 2001 came by. Helena left her house after working on her computer. She would not come back home after that. According to the investigations they did on those days, that same day, Helena had received a phone call and after she left her house taking her car. In the flat of her two hiking friends, Monse Kierte, a teacher, and Sante Leglesa, a criminal lawyer, someone drugged her, leaving her unconscious in order to kidnap her. Still being alive, they took her to the roof of the same building, from where she was pushed between three and five in the morning. Two days after, she had left her home. Inside her system, she had about 35 sleeping pills. The autopsy states that she was in a coma when she was pushed into the patio and died due to the impact on the ground. Her father had reported her missing after a few days, which led the police to deduce and finally conclude that the woman who had been pushed was indeed Elena Jobany. The Evidence and Accusations Initial police inquiries suggested that the victim could have committed suicide. However, her naked body with cigarette burns and her folded clothes on the terrace, as well as the suspicious white substance found in her genitals, which was never reported, led investigators to believe that it was at least a homicide. All evidence pointed to Monte Carta and her partner Santi as well as a third friend named Anna Ekeguivel. None of the three could say for sure what they had been doing the night Helena was killed. In 2002, Monse was arrested as the murderer. She was sent to jail without bail. While she was in prison, Sante and Anna were being investigated. On the 23rd of March, Anna, then 32, also resident in the building where Helena was killed, was arrested when a handwriting test determined that she was the author of the first half of the second anonymous note that Jubini had received two weeks prior to her death. On the 7th of May, Monte was found dead hanging from the ceiling in her cell with a note next to her claiming she was innocent. Anna was in pretrial detention and was released soon after in June. The case was finally closed in October 2005 when the judge considered that the evidence was not sufficient to support any accusation. As of 2020, the court of Savadell has agreed to reopen the investigation into the murder of Helena Jubini, which has been at a standstill since 2005. Monse Kerta, Helena's friend who lived where she was found dead, committed suicide in prison. This is the cover of a terrible case that remains unsolved to today, despite the fact that another suspect, Sante Laglacia, Kerta's boyfriend, was for months the main suspect, but was never arrested. The family before the case prescribed managed to give some new evidence in which they pointed another possible suspect. However, some recent DNA tests have proved this theory wrong.
who murdered Ivan Mayick on his way to get kidney dialysis treatment. Ivan Mayick, a 78-year-old retiree, was murdered as he waited for his kidney dialysis treatment center to open early in the morning of Saturday, April 10, 2021. The killing was in Arlington, Washington, about 50 miles north of Seattle. The Arlington Police Department said surveillance footage shows Ivan Mayick, 78, stopped at a bank in Marysville and withdrew cash from an ATM before driving to the facility at about 5.30 a.m. He parked near the front of the building in the parking lot. An SUV was seen on surveillance footage following Mayick's car north on Smoky Point Boulevard and into the parking lot. The suspect got out of the car and approached Mayick, according to police. Employees who were leaving the building told police the suspect opened Mayick's car door and shot him. Police said the suspect then shot at the employees who ran back into the building uninjured. The suspect then fled the scene. Authorities have footage of the suspect's vehicle at several points and have indicated that it's believed to be a dark-colored 2013 or 2014 Range Rover Sport. His family pledged a $25,000 reward for information leading to the killer. Since the killing, there have been zero announced developments in this case. The detail about the vehicle being a dark-colored 2003 or 2014 Range Rover Sport seemed especially promising. It seemed like it would be simple to find the few registered owners and go get the suspect. But nothing. A later report from about a year after the killing now indicated that the killer also fired several shots at nearby witnesses before escaping in a black SUV, possibly a Jeep with silver rims. So perhaps they misidentified the vehicle at first. It's such a strange and awful case. He was followed from an ATM in the very early morning, miles away to the kidney center, and then the killer opened his door and shot him at point-blank range, before also shooting at some witnesses. Was this a random thrill kill? Was it some extended road rage situation? Nothing in Mr. Meg's background indicates nothing other than a lovely, older, retiree. And that, dear listeners, is the end of these Unsolved Mysteries Volume 4. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.